The first chapter of my life was in a professional boys' choir. That's how I learned a lot about music, and that's what I did until my voice changed. But I had a tape recorder from a very young age, which I made from the choir, because we, we were professional. <laughs> and um, I would record everybody's records, and I was into soul music a lot. Beatles came along when I was 13, courtesy of my sisters, I think, more than anything else. I enjoyed it. I also liked the Kinks, who were sort of a local band. And I switched over, as you might think. To, and I was playing jazz, too, uh, with two guys from school. In London, when I was a teenager, the, obviously the Marquee Club was the famous marquee it was cheap they didn't have a bar so i could go in as a 16 year old 15 16 year old so all the great bands there the who the yardbirds um i saw yes one night when there were 11 people in the audience if you can believe it they had thursday night residency and one cold rainy night i went down along with 10 other people <laughs> <laughs> and they were mind-blowing in the early days. I mean, I listened to everything, and I played guitar in uh, the high school band until the bass player started writing songs, and he wanted to play guitar on his own songs. And that was what got us noticed by this very, very small record company. <laughs> There's a five CD retrospective that we've been working on all year, released in February. Byzantium is the band that is the retrospective of. Um, but in fact, I was Byzantium's producer and sometimes engineer. But the first of the five CDs is the high school band, which has some of the same members, some of the same songs and demos and, you know, like they do with box sets. The tiny record company that that um, put out the high school band record, he decided to build a studio, and he knew nothing about it. He basically just he had a bingo hall, <laughs> and he instructed his two workmen to cut off a corner of the bingo hall and make a studio. That was about all the instructions they had. So, um, but he did know to buy pretty good equipment. And I was really not his protege, but I, he'd used me for odd things, you know, running masters around London, and playing piano actually on a couple of records that he made. And that was fun. Um, so I was able to hang around in the studio and I had about a week where I went in every night with a friend and I figured everything out. And the next week, <laughs> The next week, the engineer didn't turn up for quite a big session with orchestral instruments and, you know, people being paid money that the session had to happen. So I just said, I think I can handle it. So I did. And there you are. I was an engineer from that day on. <laughs> Slept under the piano quite often. <laughs> you know, it was a one man operation pretty much. And at the end of the session, I had to clean up beer and cigarettes mostly and um, I was just too tired to go home and I knew I had to be back in just a few hours anyway. <laughs> Quite a time, I mean I think back now I've never worked as hard as I did then. And I, you know I was 19 when I started doing that. A lot of my clients took me to other studios around London so I became pretty well known in the studio scene. <laughs> but my favorite client was Rory Gallagher. He was such a nice guy and a really great player. And he wasn't very demanding. He wanted to do live vocals and live lead guitar and then see if there was anything else. And um, he got me out of the studio. He took me on several tours that we recorded. Um, Irish Tour 74 is probably his best known album. And, I was there in Cork, <laughs> trying to stay sober. <laughs> I feel like I didn't see any summers 
for about six years. And it was nice to get out of the studio. My friends in the band Caravan lived in Canterbury, which is a beautiful part of the country. And I, one day I just left the studio and got straight on a train to Canterbury and it was, ah, oh, great. But then the bass playing came back into my life. You see, that was really um, a big change. And then I got recommended to this singer, Dana Gillespie, who had um, main man management, which was David Bowie's management. And she said she wanted to get a live band together. And I, would I be the bass player and would I do the arrangements for it? was just writing out chords, really. All of a sudden, she, she took us to New York. And there we were, having a fabulous time on David Bowie's coattails, spending a lot of money. His manager, Tony DeFries, um, had a concept where he'd spend as much of the record company money as possible because then they'd take notice of the album and promote it and so on and so forth, which worked for David. Didn't really work for our band, but we had still had a great, great time living it up in New York for a couple of weeks in Philadelphia, spending David's money or RCA's money. At the end of that, I stayed in New York City until my money ran out. And I met this band who some friends took me over there and they were rehearsing as a three-piece without a bass player. And they, I thought I really liked their songs and their attitude. So I sat in as, you know, unknown British bass players would do. And it sounded like a real band. So I went home and a few months later they said, you know, soon to tour, soon to record, we want you. And that was amazing. I pretty much packed up and left England as soon as I could, moved to New York. And indeed, they'd signed with Arista Records with Clive Davis. They had big time management, lawyers, accountants, the whole deal, agents, William Morris. <laughs> and we toured around and moved to LA after about six months, 76 through 78. And that was one of the best experiences of my life because we, we lived together, we wrote songs, we made demos in the house, which I engineered, of course. And um, it just felt really good playing with those people. It was, you know, it was, unfortunately, the timing was wrong. They were um, really good, you know, we did four part harmonies, nice, fairly short songs good grooves and, and a little bit of comedy even thrown in. In fact, we did a pre precursor to Saturday Night Live. It was Saturday Night with Howard Cosell. And um, the management was big time and mostly did comedians, unfortunately. And that's why we moved to LA because they had a couple of comedians who were starting to do very well named Robin Williams, uh, David Letterman, and Billy Crystal. So couldn't compete with that. So we moved to LA and it was it was so exciting. You know, we, they had a, an office on the Paramount lot and we got the VIP tour and, you know, people, uh, I don't know, saying, oh, you got a great future. You know, you, we'll, we'll figure out a show for you guys. You know, was, we did all the TV shows, Midnight Special, um, tonight Show, Merv Griffin. <laughs> um, so I got a real taste of the industry with that band. But um, as successful as their comedians were, they didn't really know what to do with us. So we fell apart. New York, Arista were really good. Uh, we got to LA and people were going, well, who are you guys? We don't know about you. So. And when the band split up, I had to play disco, but we won't talk about that. You know, I had no, no money, no car. So I took top 40 work, which as I mentioned, was, was mostly disco in those days. And um, Rory Gallagher came to my rescue again. He was working with a producer up here called Elliot Mazer. And um, 
he wasn't happy with the mixes, so he suggested that I come up and remix. Um, and we got as far as the mastering room and he decided to drop the whole project. But meanwhile, I had a good relationship with Elliot and I came up and engineered a couple of albums for him and found an apartment. And that was it, because I, I'd had enough of LA for three years. <laughs> Lived in San Francisco for the next 20 years of my life. Well, my favorite time was when I was with that band, The Movies, in New York and LA, especially when we were in New York. It just felt exciting that just around the corner, something was going to happen and I'm going to break. Um, and what happened actually was punk rock came along and nobody wanted to listen to us anymore. But that was a period of my life that I wish I could go back to and, you know, rejoin it.